This is Finding and Categorizing Your Income Sources, one module in the workshop, How to Complete Your 2018 Grad Student Tax Return. I'm Emily Roberts of Personal Finance for PhDs. This module covers the vital first step toward preparing your grad student tax return. It's a simple step to actually carry out, but it's not so well understood. So we need to go through a little bit of background information before I can explain exactly what to do in this module. As the title states, you're going to find and then categorize into one of two categories your grad student income sources. So there are three types of pay that you may receive as a graduate student, and I'm going to explain the tax forms that are associated with each of those types so you know what to look out for. The three types are assistantships, fellowships, and scholarships. Now, assistantships, as in research assistantships, teaching assistantships, graduate assistantships, they pay your stipend or your salary. Second type, fellowship, also pays your stipend or your salary. And fellowship is a little bit of a catch-all term, but basically how I'm using it is something that pays your stipend or salary that is not an assistantship. So perhaps it could be a training grant. Third type, scholarship, is another catch-all term. What I mean is money that you've been given that goes toward paying your education expenses. So another term you might hear is tuition waiver or tuition remission. But basically, this is the part of your funding as a graduate student that's going directly to paying expenses. The reason why you're receiving each of these three types of income is actually important for your taxes. So with an assistantship, you are working to receive that income. You have an employer-employee relationship with your university as well as a student relationship. Now, with fellowships and scholarships, you are not technically working to receive that money. They are awards that have been granted to you, most likely because of merit, you know, the, the merit that you demonstrate by being admitted to your graduate program or by submitting, you know, through an application process for an external award. It may seem really strange or even insulting to hear that you are not working for your fellowship. You're not working to receive your fellowship income. Of course, you're going through all the same activities that you know a research assistant would, but the difference is just where your money is coming from. Fellowships are given to you to further your own individual work towards your dissertation, whereas with a research assistantship, generally you'd be working off of like a grant. Throughout this workshop, I'll use two terms to describe the category of income that you receive. Compensatory pay comes from work, and those are the assistantships, and non-compensatory pay are the fellowships and scholarships. Now, it's very possible that your university does not use these terms, assistantship or fellowship, exactly the way that I'm using them. I know there's some deviation from this norm. So really what we need to do to firmly, definitively divide compensatory from non-compensatory pay in terms of grad student income is to look at the tax forms associated with each type. If you are receiving compensatory pay, you will receive a W-2 at tax time for your stipend or salary. That's the most definitive thing you're going to hear in this section. You will receive a W-2. This is what a W-2 looks like. It's the form that all employees in America receive. So it may be familiar to you if you had, you know, a compensatory type job before entering graduate school. And your stipend or your salary, or at least the part of it that came from an assistantship, will show up in box one. Now your fellowship income is a little bit more difficult because universities have different ways of reporting it and some of them even have multiple ways that they might report it or not report it. So this is gonna take a little bit longer. Your fellowship might be reported to you on a 1098T. If your income is reported on a 1098T, it's going to be in box five, scholarships or grants. And that is in addition to the scholarship money that you may receive which will also be posted in box five. So if you receive a 1090T and you also have a fellowship, you need to do a little bit of legwork to figure out if what's in box five is only scholarships or scholarships plus your fellowship. 
it also might show up on a 1099 miscellaneous in box three. Now, I only know for sure of one university, Duke University, that reports um, fellowships this way. There may be others, but I know for sure that Duke does it this way. So if you receive a 1099 miss, your fellowship income will be in box three. This is actually really important, which box it's in, because box seven, non-employee compensation, is where income is typically reported on a 1099 miscellaneous, and that's for self-employed or contractor type of income. So it's actually really easy when universities use this form for students to get confused and maybe start thinking they're self-employed just because they're receiving a 1099 miscellaneous, but that's not the case. Your fellowship or your training grant income is going to show up in box three, not box seven, and it is still for a fellowship, etc. Now, if you do have a 1099 miscellaneous with box seven income, that means that you were hired as a contractor or you're self-employed and probably you like negotiated and know exactly why that happened. If for some reason you receive that a 1099 miss with box seven income and you're not sure what's going on and you think it's for your role as a graduate student, check up on that because it's possible that a mistake has been made. Third possibility is not an official tax form at all, but rather a courtesy letter. This is an example of a courtesy letter that Duke used some years ago. And basically, it's just an informal letter that tells you how much you received in fellowship income in that calendar year. And that's all it says. And finally, you may receive absolutely no communication whatsoever regarding your fellowship from your university or your funding agency or your institution. That is actually pretty common. And it can be really, really confusing because you might think like, oh, I didn't receive any tax forms. Like I don't need to pay taxes or I need to fill out a tax return. That's that's not the case. They don't have to provide you with any kind of documentation. Uh, and, and again, it's pretty it's pretty common that that happens. So don't get confused by that. Um, you still, if you're receiving, you know, a stipend or salary, it's coming from somewhere and it's it's up to you to track down the numbers in that case. Now, regarding your scholarship, et cetera, kind of income, if it's going to show up anywhere, it's going to be on a 1098T. Here is the 1098T again. And so if you receive a 1098T, your scholarship income will be in box five. But remember, if you have a fellowship, your fellowship income might also be in box five. So if you have a fellowship, you need to figure out um, if it's included in box five or not. If not, then it's just going to be your scholarship income. Or if you don't have a fellowship, it'll just be the scholarship income. (laughs) Once again, it's also possible that your university will not issue you any official tax forms with respect to your scholarship income. Universities are supposed to issue 1098Ts by default, but in the case when the box five income equals or exceeds the box one um, money paid towards the higher education expenses, Um, then they don't have to issue the 1098T. So for a fully funded graduate student whose fees are completely paid by scholarship, your university is not required to issue a 1098T in that case. Now, some of them will uh, anyway, just as a courtesy, but they don't have to. However, there's another workaround to get this information, which is to go directly into your student account, whether that's called, you know, your bursar account or your cashier's account. Maybe there's another term for it, but the place where your scholarships are posted and where your expenses are posted. This is a screenshot from my student account from when I was at Duke. And what I recommend doing is what I have done here. So I have highlighted all of the um, payments that were made on my behalf to my student account, all the scholarship money that was incoming to my student account. And what I've done with these different colors is I've matched each of those scholarship payments up with the tuition or fee charge that they're associated with. And I've left out of that the postings that I made to my own account that were not scholarship income and not for these types of fees. So in this step right here, go into your student account and look at all the scholarship money that has been posted there and add that up. That is part of your income for this year. Okay, last step here. And this is the really simple step. Like all of that was just understanding what's going on and and looking out for your forms or understanding that you won't receive forms. This is the really simple step at the end of this part of the process. I want you to come away with two numbers. 
The first number, figure number one, is the sum of all your W-2 income in 2018. Maybe you only received one W-2 in 2018, then that's really simple. It's just that number in box one of your one W-2 in 2018. But if you had, maybe you switched to your university from a different type of job, whatever it is, add all of your W-2 income up together. That is your, your first number. Now, the second number is the sum of all the non-compensatory income that you had in 2018. That's fellowships and scholarships. Whether it's reported somewhere, whether it's not reported somewhere and you just had to go into your student account or go into your bank account and figure out what it was, sum all of your non-compensatory income. And I know that number is going to be like scary large, but just stick with me. Now, what do you do with these numbers? Figure number one is it's really easy. You're going to pop that into Form 1040, which is the form you fill out for your tax return. Form 1040 in line one, right there. Sum of all your W-2 income. Easy peasy. Now for figure number two, you have to use your QEEs, your qualified education expenses, to massage that number a little bit before you plug it into your tax return or plug it into your tax software. So you're going to do one of two things. You're going to use your QEEs to make sum or all of figure number two, tax-free, or you're going to report sum or all of figure two in your income and also take a tax credit. Now, it's important that you don't just ignore your scholarship income. Um, First of all, because it may or may not be equal to your QEs. You're really not supposed to just ignore it. You have to check. Is it greater than your QEs, less than your QEs? But the other thing is that if you do end up taking a tax credit, that's money off of your taxes that you don't have to pay. And so it really behooves you to investigate this fully so you can possibly reduce the amount of tax that you owe. And this is something that tax software or tax preparer could be able to do for you if you give them the numbers they're looking for in the proper way. Or you could just do it yourself by you know, creating your own tax return manually. When it comes to preparing numbers to put into your tax return or to put into software or to hand over to your tax preparer, you have to remember the phrase garbage in, garbage out. If you just throw numbers that you find at any of those processes, you're not going to come out with an accurate tax return and you may come out with a tax return that, you know, you're paying more tax than you need to. So it's really worth the time to understand the nuances here a little bit and feed quality information into these processes so you can get a quality tax return back. A quality tax return and tax that has been minimized um, as much as possible. So how do we take that next step? This video was one module of the workshop, How to Complete Your 2018 Grad Student Tax Return and Understand It Too. There are five core videos that will help any graduate student complete and understand his tax return. Then there are four videos that you can pick and choose from depending on what's relevant to your personal situation. These videos are pre-recorded, so it's totally up to your own schedule how quickly you move through them. But the workshop is not just videos. It also includes two worksheets to help you keep track of all your numbers and keep everything organized for when you actually go to plug them into your tax return or your software or give them over to your tax preparer. Plus, and this is really the best part, there are four live Q&A sessions with me between January and April 2019. One in January, one in February, one in March, and one just before the deadline in April. So in those Q&A sessions, I will be delighted to try to answer any question you have related to your higher education income and expenses and your tax return. So you can show up live and ask and answer your question and we can have a conversation. Or if you know you can't make it to one of the workshops, you can submit your question to me in advance. I'll answer it during the workshop and then you can view the recording. So I hope that sounds like exactly what you're looking for this tax season. The workshop will be released on Friday, January 18th, 2019 at 12 p.m. Pacific. The full price is $19.99. You can go to pfrphds.com slash 2018 tax workshop. That's all one word to purchase the workshop. Now, if you go to that URL before the workshop's release on January 18th, 
you can sign up on that page to get a $5 early bird discount code. So once you sign up, I will email you the code. All you have to do is purchase the workshop using the code before January 18th. The price will be $14.99. However, if you're watching this video after the release, it's totally fine. It will be at full price, but you can go to that same URL to purchase the workshop. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you got a ton out of it and I look forward to clearing up any remaining questions you have in one of the workshop Q&A sessions.